Hi, this is Salim Omar. I'm leaving home to head to my office because someone's waiting to interview me on a topic I tried to avoid for years and years. You see, the most common question that I receive from fellow practitioners is a variation of, Salim, if there was only one thing I could do that would propel my practice to success, what, it, what would it be? Everyone wants to know if they could do that, that one thing what would it be? Now, as you may already know, there are many moving parts to operating a successful practice. However, all things are not created equal, especially when it comes to a CPA firm. So I finally succumbed to the one thing question, and today I'm gonna to reveal what that one thing is. It pays for my beautiful home, it pays for my seven-figure practice, it pays for my cars, my vacations, my kids' college education, and my own retirement. And in a moment, I'll tell you where to get it in abundance and how to master it to live the lifestyle you always wanted to live. I'll see you shortly. Salim, I'm really looking forward to this interview. We're here in your beautiful offices. You know, you and I have known each other for a lot of years, and I know that uh, now you're one of the really leading practitioners in the CPA world, but I know that that hasn't always been that way. Uh, you went through or you started out with some tough times. Um, can you take a few minutes and kind of tell me how you got started and how you reached the level of success that you have now? Of course. You know, if you think about it, the path that we take is pretty much the same in terms of myself or the person watching this video, is that we go to CPA school, we go to college and then we get our CPA license and then we end up working for someone in public practice or private and then this entrepreneurial bug hits us and we say, why am I working for this fool? <laughs> why don't I do my own thing? And we start up our own practice. Now the interesting thing is that 95% of practitioners will struggle. And then you'll have this 5% that are going to be successful. And I went through that same, you know, the same journey in that I, when I was in practice in the first few years, you know, I realized that I really don't, didn't know what I was doing because I started seeing my clients come in. My clients, you know, there was a revolving door with my clients. There was a revolving door with my employees. I had cash issues and things weren't just going right. And I came to that realization. Didn't have, I didn't know what I was doing and running, running a successful practice. And I started looking for answers outside myself. So I started recruiting or really looking for uh, entrepreneurs, folks that had created successful businesses, started learning from them and started applying it to my practice. And I started seeing changes, small improvements and very encouraging from what I'd seen before of trying to do the th same things that I'd seen other practitioners do within my own industry. And that was my journey where I took my practice from where it was uh, unsuccessful and struggling and challenging and working long hours to creating an eight-person CPA firm uh, that I call my lifestyle. It's a, it's a lifestyle practice because I work the hours that I want to work, the days that I want to work, with the clients that I want to work, and I've got a great team of people, that I, you know, employees that I, that I work with. And that was kind of my, my transformation, and I see a lot of uh, CPAs kind of go through that and then they work for someone and then they start their own practice and then I kind of see that 95% struggling and then the 5% that are successful the ones who realize they don't have the answers and they start looking for those answers so the important point that I want to make is you know for, for the person watching this is to not reinvent the system right once you identify someone who is doing it successfully and you, you know identified you know who you want to learn from follow that system don't try to reinvent it because it's going to be you know you're going to be losing a lot of money and time doing that now one of the most common questions that you get and, and i'm sure what most uh, cpas and other business owners would love to know is what's the one thing that uh, will make them successful can you quickly talk about what the one really important thing is that that uh, you know that leads to success so it's the one thing question and I get I do get asked that a lot Sully what is that one thing that I need to do 
to get the results that I, that I want. And really that one thing is client attraction. It's having the right type of clients because uh, the way to look at it, Bernie, is that clients are the currency to having the life that you want. They are the currency. They are what pay for the nice house. And clients are what pay for the college education. You've got your 14 year old, I've got two that are gonna be going to college fairly soon, right? They are, clients are the currency. They are what pay for vacations and, and charitable work. However, the, the, you know, the practice owner wants to live the life that's what it pays for. And not having the right clients can be a dread. Uh, I talk to practitioners that have kind of headed up to here with their practice. And I was in that same shoe myself where, you know, the first few years I'm like, what am I doing with this thing, man? I really need to get out of my practice. So what I'm gonna do is in two years, I wanna sell my practice and get out of it. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it was a dream that I once, once had that had turned now into a nightmare and when you change things and you have the right type of clients, you end up with a practice that becomes a dream lifestyle practice. It's a, you know, you kind of, it reignites your passion when you've got the right type of clients that you're working with. Mm -hmm. So I think clients are the one thing that is really makes or breaks a pr practice. I, you know, it makes so much sense to me when you, when you put it that way. So why is client attraction so difficult for most CPA firms? Client attraction is difficult because of commoditization. There are way too many. There's there's a lot of CPAs. It's very competitive. You've got you've got softwares in the mix. You've got QuickBooks that came into in you know the advent of QuickBooks. You've got TurboTax. You've got bookkeepers. You've got C accountants working in corporate America. They want to now start their own practice. So it's just a very competitive environment. And on top, of, on top of that, you've got an individual or prospective clients that are bombarded with advertising messages. You get, you know, 3,000 messages in the course of a day between radio and TV and newspaper ads and social media and all that. It's like continual bombardment of distraction and clutter. How, do, how does one CPA stand out with all that, with all that noise that's going, going around? And how do you, as a marketer, separate yourself from that clutter so that your message captures the attention of the target market or the target client that you want to attract. It's giving clients, prospective clients, what they want. What do, what do they want? And there was this you know, phenomenal book written a number of years back, Firm of the Future, um, Ron Baker and, and Paul Dunn. And they wrote this book and they did a lot of analysis of surveying business owners to see what they wanted and the first thing did you know what the first thing on the list is reducing anxiety that's the first thing that business owners want from the cpa reducing anxiety and let's think about it for a moment you know let's think about it in that when you know in, in the way it rolls out for most cpa you know practitioners practices is that the client's going to come during tax season or whatever drop off the tax, rich, the, the tax documents, and they don't hear from their CPA or their staff for days, sometimes weeks. Imagine what's going on in the head of the, of the, of the client. They're not, you know, they don't know. Are they gonna get money back? Are they gonna owe money? Are, were there any questions on the information? Was everything clear? And this is kind of the way things are for, in, in, sadly, in a lot of you know, practices. So the way to break out of it is to offer, is to give what the client wants. So reducing anxiety is one of them. For business owners, it's, it's helping them with their business. It's helping them make their business more profitable. It's helping them, you know, having a more cash, uh, steady cash. It's helping them to become more profitable with pay less taxes. These are all things that are keeping people, business owners up at night. And if the, if the CPA practitioner, if the firm's disconnected with that, if they're pushing papers and they're pushing documents and they're not connecting, they're not engaging their, you know, the business owner with those things, then now you've become what everybody else has become, which is just offering, you know, number crunching. You're not really giving them advice that really helps them do what they want to do. You've developed and you teach a five-part formula for better positioning. Tell me a little bit about that. 
Sure. So the five parts, Bernie, is the first one is preparation, which is a commodity. And then you've got protection. And then you've got trust and you've got advice and you've got five star customer service. So let me give the example of protection. You know, one of the biggest fears that business owners have that in, you know, families, individuals have is that of the IRS. It's right up there with public speaking and it's right along, along right there with, with that. Imagine that, that the IRS is such a feared thing. Now you've got uh, uh, an individual reaching out to their, in their mailbox on a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening, tired coming from, from work, and they reach out and they're looking through the mail and there's a letter from the IRS. Do you think this individual is going to sleep at night on Friday or on, or on Saturday and they attend this party on, on Sunday, a birthday party or a graduation party, and all they are thinking about in their head is what? The IRS! And the CPA, the pr practice owner, really has to position themselves that, you know, that they are the, the person, they are the firm that are helping them, that are protecting their clients from the IRS. So now you've got not only preparation services, which most practitioners, by the way, pigeonhole hold themselves in, you've got protection as well, and then you've got trust. And we'll talk more about that, and you've got advice, you know, and then the five-star customer service. I saw myself, when I started my practice, I was just in the first thing, preparation. And pigeonholed myself in that, I was getting beaten by clients for fees, and I started looking at it from a more holistic standpoint. And that was when my practice really started becoming um, dominant in my area and I became the number one player in my local area when I started positioning myself as offering all those things and there's big opportunities for those practitioners that recognize this that they have been operating they've been playing with preparation and then there's so much more that they can and should be doing in their practice well that's really that, that's really fascinating can you share some stories of practitioners sort of on a before and after uh, basis on what they were doing before and how they fixed it? Yeah, I've seen, I mean, you know, those that have recognized it and started implementing it in their practice, I've seen their revenues go up, their billings go up. Uh, I've seen them work less in their practice. So I've seen 60, 70 hour work weeks go down to 30, 40 hour work weeks. I've seen them going with lots of staff or staff that they didn't really particularly enjoy working with that were not uh, productive, that were incompetent to, to some extent, and they've gone to you know having uh, people on the team that they truly value. And so they've really created a, an organization, a practice, that's been a transformation because they saw themselves in a, in a different light from just being preparation to being a whole lot more for their clients. I can't think of a single business owner that wouldn't want to work less and make more, so uh, that sounds great. And it's the reason we start our practice. It's the reason a business owner starts their, their business, is to do that. And then with time, we kind of lose that. You know, the dream starts fading away and we become slaves of our business, of our practice. Yeah, that's really true. Um, so how do you then attract these clients that are willing to pay you 5000 or $10,000 in fees a year? You know, we've gone from an information age to an, you know, to the need for an advisory. You know, it's more, the, the need has gone more into advisory. I mean, we've got tons of information and there's this thing called Google. You type in a word and there's like lots of information that comes up on any particular topic. And so there's lots of that. There is a shortage of advice, of good advice. And that's what the business owner wants, right? That's what the business owner wants is good information, or not really good information, but good advice. It's interpreting information into advice, into what do I do here? It's what's the best situation? What's the best scenario? What's the best strategy that's gonna work in my business to, to do what I wanna you know, what I want what I wanna do. So it's practitioners that recognize this, that this, you know, there's a you know, change, there's a dis, you know, distinction between information and advice. And those that are then uh, delivering that to their, to their clients is, are the ones that are now seeing the, the benefits of really attracting clients and really engaging their clients. And the clients are gonna hire them because that's what they want. They want a CPA, they wanna work with a CPA who can help them reach their goals. So that sounds great, uh, but what is the marketing approach to attracting those prospects so that they will become your clients? That's a great question. 
and you and I were talking earlier on and it was like you know if you you know if you want to attract deer put salt in your backyard uh, and if you put cheese you'll end up attracting mice or if you have, you know put sugar you'll end up attracting ants right this was a discussion you and you and I had earlier on and that's so true I mean if you look at a CPA practice if you want to attract the right clients make sure that what you're doing is bringing in those clients and and when I started my practice uh, I had telemarketers, I had two telemarketers, and they would make phone calls, cold calls to business owners in my area, including new business owners. And they would get an appointment for me to be in front of the business owner. And I would bring them in, I would sign them up with, you know, with my story of my pitch was fees. I can do this in a cheaper way. And I ended up with a practice that was all small business owners that weren't the type of business owners that I wanted. And in my mind, I said, you know what? I, this is not where I want to go. This is, I want higher end business owners. I want higher end clients. So I changed my marketing strategy. It became, I changed it from a very important distinction from chasing prospects into having prospects pursue me, right? And that became my, you know, the client attraction system that I created is what do I do? How can I have clients you know, how do I have clients pursue me rather than me having to change it? It's, it's a very important thing is how you sign up client. You know, the relationship that you have with a business owner is very much dependent on how you bring them in in the first place. The more you chase them, the tougher they're going to be like, they're going to be in charge <laughs> of the relationship. And the last thing you want is the client in charge of a relationship because they're like, okay, what can you do for me now? What can you do for me now? And that's not the client that you want. So I totally transformed my, 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 my marketing where it became very trust-based marketing, became very education-based marketing. And what that really entails is creating a magnet. It starts with creating a magnet, a special report, an article, uh, a, a talk, where those that, are, that fit your target market will raise their hand and say, you know what, Salim, I liked what you said here. And I've had this, I've signed up so many clients that saw my book on, in the bookshelf of a bookstore or somebody recommended my, a, a book of mine or a special report. And they read that and they come to the conclusion and they say, you know what, I like what this guy represents. I like what he's saying here. My current accountant is not sharing with me. I just had this conversation last week, as a matter of fact. I was meeting with a prospect in my conference room and, say, and I signed them up and this guy said, my current accountant is not telling me these things that you've written in your book. <laughs> and I want you because I like what you're, what you're saying here. So totally kind of, it's a full 360 degree turnaround with the client instead of you chasing the client. It's a client coming here, you know, you know coming to see you, wanting more, wanting that help. Celine, that, that sounds really interesting. I, I can't think of anybody that doesn't want prospects chasing them as opposed to the other way around. Um, can you give us a story or an example of uh, maybe a specific client that found you uh, because of your trust-based marketing? Well, yeah, I mean, most of my clients are, I sign up, we, you know, with the, my firm signs up, really come from this process. I've got lots of examples, but the one that really comes to my mind is that one that happened several years back, and this is six, seven years back, and my book had come out, my, my book, Straight Talk About Small Business Success in New Jersey. So I get this phone, my firm gets this phone, phone call from this lady who sets up uh, an appointment with me, uh, to meet with me, uh, and this was, you know, a couple of weeks, a week or so from the time she called, she wanted to, you know, come and meet with me. So she sets the appointment at quarter to 6 p.m., and she was working full time in a, in a company and she was looking to start her own business. So she sets the appointment, I guess, you know, giving her, allowing her enough time to drive to my office and, and doing that. So it's quarter to six. And this was like seven, six, seven years back. And it was a time where I would, you know, wait for a client in the evening. I don't do that anymore. You know, they come when my, during my business hours. So anyway, so this client comes in at quarter to six. So now I'm the only one in the office. My, everybody's left. And, uh, so from, you know, it's 5.15 p.m., you know, the appointment's at quarter to six, so I'm kind of doing my work, and I start hearing this thumping voice. Bah, bah, bah. I'm like, all right, it's one of my t other tenants in the building, they're probably doing something. And it just continues on and on, and I kind of ignore it, just thinking it's one of my tenants. At quarter to six, 30 minutes later, since the time the thumping started, 
the, the, the door kind of starts opening up and I hear this voice, somebody saying, a lady saying, Salim, and I rush out of my office. I'm like, who the heck is this now? You know, it's, you know, is it my appointment? And, um, and, I, and I see this lady with two crutches, you know, and, and, and just barely making it, she's got sweat on her, you know, on her, on her forehead. And she walks in and I'm like, how the heck did this lady walk up the two flights of stairs to come to my office? And, and, and the reason I bring this story up is that's the power of a book. She had, saw, she had seen my book, she had read it, and she wanted to work with me. So typically I'd, I'd you know, get somebody to, the conf to my conference room, I'd say, let's please come into the conference room. I had my meeting with her right in the reception area. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want this lady to walk any more than she has to because she struggled for 30 minutes. And to this day, it boggles me and I get goosebumps talking about this because such a powerful, uh, you're talking about client attraction, mm -hmm. right? Somebody is seeing something, a magnet, be it a book, be it a special report, be it a, a, a speech, and they hear you, they read about you, and they're like, he's the one I want. He's, you know, for whatever reason, they've connected with you. Yeah. And that's what, what, what client attraction is about. So I've heard you talk about uh, a shock and awe package. Can you give me a little bit of insight into what, what do you put in a shock and awe? What is a shock and awe package? Okay, so the shock and off package is one of the things that we do. It's, it's a sales, you know, our sales process is orchestrated right from the time the client, the prospect calls my office and the way we engage them, the front office per people will engage them in asking them questions, you know, and then really then getting their information, setting up the appointment a week or so later. It's delayed. It's never the same day. It's never two days later. It's always de delayed so that we can send them this shock and off package. In this shock and off package is my book, is testimonials, social proof from other clients of mine saying great things about the, you know, my firm. And it's articles that I've written. So it's really, they get this thick package of information which is entertaining as well as an entertaining value. It's not about tax articles or it's not about tax reduction stuff. So it's, it's a mix of all that. And the goal is for the, for the prospect to go through that information and then when I'm meeting with them, they're pretty much signed up. You know, you know, then I'm kind of going through the formalities of sign here and do this and do that. And you know, that whole process continues up until the time I sign them up. But that's what the shock and off package is, is information really preparing them for the meeting with me. Hmm. Um, you know, I have to say that, that sounds, it sounds like you're spending quite a bit of money to attract a client. I mean, how much, how much can you afford to spend to get a client in the front door? Good question. Uh, you know, when you look at it, if a client's going to be paying you $5,000 a year in fees, $10,000 a, a year in fees, and that's just one year, lifetime value is probably twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So my question is, how much can one spend? I'm going to kind of, you know, rephrase that question or, you know, really talk through this question in that how much can a person, how much can a business owner, a practice owner spend to bring in a client that's going to pay you $35,000 a year? Quite a bit of money. You know, there's a lot we can do with uh, when you've got that kind of a client that you're going to sign up. You can be very creative. You, you can do a lot. You know, you can, you can sp invest $500. You, you can spend up to $500, $1,000. And there's things that you can do. You can send that package, that information in a FedEx envelope. That will get their attention. You can put your own book in. That will get their attention. You can put a CD in. So different ways that you can um, you can spice that that up. And there is definitely the money because now you've got a client that's going to pay you thirty five, forty, fifty thousand dollars over the lifetime value. I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about a practice. Uh, you know, once you've attracted the types of clients that you want. I gotta believe it's a lot easier to have a practice and, and have the type of practice that you might want uh, as a CPA practitioner if you have, let's say, 100 clients each paying you $10,000 versus 1,000 clients uh, each paying you $1,000. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. You know, less is more. And in this case here, the example that you gave Less is more. 100 clients, it's, it's much easier, uh, much more fun to have a practice 
where you you know where you've got a hundred relationships that you're managing versus a thousand relationships much more chances of things going wrong many more employees to manage just much you know the, the headaches quadruple when you go when you're in that situation so I'm a, I'm a believer of less is more here hundred clients paying ten grand or 200 clients paying five grand is much better than you know tripling the number of clients and reducing reducing the fee you're just able to do much more with the client you're able to have more of an impact with the client when you've got fewer who are paying more you can do more for them yeah uh, that that uh, I can see how true that would be you're often quoted as saying uh, that you're not in the tax preparation business, you're in the client attracting business. What do you mean when you say that? You know, the way you, the way you see your business is really very important. I'll give you a story that just happened this past weekend. My son, 12 year old, is into soccer. Glad he is since last year, loves the game. And uh, the guy is growing as well, so he's outgrowing his shoes, his soccer shoes. So we went to a sports authority and I think that's a national store. Look, you know, they've got stores everywhere. So it's a huge store. We walk in, uh, me and my family of my, my daughter, my, my son and my wife, we walk in on a Saturday evening in a sports authority. It's beautiful, like well lit, lit, you know, carpets and all that, really looking immaculate. We make our way into the soccer shoe section. And we're there for about 10 minutes, struggling, finding, looking for sizes. And we don't have a sales associate that is, you know, that's coming to attend to us. Now this is a huge store. There's three associates near the near the counter. They're kind of chatting with themselves. And what can be more important in a store than selling, right? I mean, that's the like the order of the day. You know, you know, at the end of the day, that's what you've got to track. You've got to know, right? How much sales did we do, right? Not how many, how the stock, you know, how the shelves were stocked up or if the carpets were vacuumed none of that's like that's all secondary it's important but the first thing is like selling if you don't sell there's no business we may not even open up the store tomorrow if there's no sales so i, I emphasize that because it's such an important point and i've seen that successful practitioners see themselves in the sales and marketing business not in the tax preparation business because if you're not bringing in that clients then you can do the best tax returns you can do the best strategy things but you're not really helping your, your clients from that standpoint. You know, one of my clients has uh, 80, you know, he's gonna do 18.5 million in revenues this year. And when I, whenever I ask him what business you're in, it doesn't, his answer doesn't surprise me. And that's the success he has. He, he says he's in the selling business. That's what they do. He's selling, selling, selling. So um, I hear what you're saying, uh, but I have to say that if I were to guess uh, most CPA practitioners uh, didn't get into this business, didn't start their own practices in order to become experts in selling and marketing. In fact, I would guess that the most of them, that most of them are uncomfortable, you know, using strong arm sales tactics and things along those lines. Maybe that explains why, you know, as you said earlier, 5% are truly successful. So how do we square their discomfort with selling with the need to sell their services. So it's really what do we what do we you know what is selling? You know the way I see selling it's communicating the value that I bring to a prospective client. And I feel that my firm serves a business owner in, in the way that they need to be served in really understanding the situation things we talked about you know offering advisory services more than more than information or number crunching that's my role I mean you know when I come from a selling standpoint is I have to communicate that value and that's what really selling is it's communicating value that you bring to the table for for the client so it's not the used car salesperson who is pushing services and in fact you know whenever I ask a group of practitioners that I'm speaking to that how many of you like selling? No hands go up, right? Nobody likes selling. And then when you meet a practitioner and you, you, you hear them talking to someone else, they're talking about the services. It's like you're asking someone for marriage and you haven't even gone through the, the steps leading, leading to, to, to marriage here, right? So CPS do that, they end up pushing the services and yet they don't want to do that. And really it's to engage. The selling process should be one of 
understanding what the prospects wants. What are the needs? What are the needs and wants? And then providing that in the form of a service. So, uh, I mean, thinking about all the things we talked about today, uh, the way they marketed for their clients generated a lead that was already inclined to do business with them. And so, uh, as a result of that, the selling just becomes a continuation of the trust and advice giving process. It's, you don't have to use strong arm selling techniques and uh, things that they might be uncomfortable with because they've attracted the client in the right way and it's just kind of a natural flow. So give me an example uh, or maybe talk a little bit about uh, you know, bad marketing. Now, what, what, would they, what would it be an example of some bad marketing that would, attract, would not attract the kind of clients that would be you know, open to uh, the message and you know, the type of, of relationship that the CPA wants to have with their clients? Well, I mean, bad marketing would be talking about me. It's having a boring guest, one of the relatives coming at home and talking all about them. You're like, man, this guy's boring. <laughs> it's all about me. And when I'm having a conversation with you and you feel a prospect, it's got to be all about you. It can be about me. I mean, it can be self-serving. And I think bad marketing is whenever we do everything, our ads, our sales letters, our conversations with prospects are all about Salim Omar and how great Salim Omar is and how many years in business he's been you know, in business. And that's not what the conversation should be about. So I think really shifting away from that and making it all about the prospect is where it needs to happen. In any setting, be it in, in direct marketing, be it in a networking meeting, you know, be it in a face-to-face in -face with, with someone. Okay, well, thanks, Salim. This has been incredible, and I think uh, you know, the viewers really got a lot out of it. Thanks, thanks for, yeah, great, great talking to you. So what I'd encourage folks to do is to comment on this page, the one thing that they got from watching this. You know, what is that one thing that they got from watching it? You know, please, you know, put that comment in and so that uh, it can be very interactive. Thanks for having me.